I'm Stephanie. Hi, I'm Angela. We are the Ink Mages. Join us as we discuss all things fantasy, world building, story craft, myths and legends, and of course, our own imaginative stories. Hello and welcome to the Ink Mages podcast. We are going to be bringing you another writing tip episode. And I'm excited to do this one because it's going to be all about tension. Now, I love tension. (laughs) If you have read my books, you may have realized that I love nail gripping tension. I love high stakes. I love characters not getting along, having arguments. (laughs) I love action scenes. So tension is, I like to think of it as the lifeblood of your story. It, as Angela says, it is the thing that makes readers lean in and want more. So I, I have seven tips for infusing tension into your story. So what is tension? It is the anticipation of what will happen next in your story. So the definition comes from Latin, which is tensio, meaning stretched as in extension. So Tension is like a stretching out of a scene, a sequence to its maximum point of tension. Now, why is tension important? Because without it, your scene is going to fall flat. It is going to be boring and thus you will lose readers. So if you're finding as you're having beta readers reading your story and they're just not feeling like the pacing is good, they're losing interest, it's probably because you just don't have enough conflict. Don't have enough tension happening between either characters or the overarching theme in the story. So we are going to do some tips here that'll help you infuse the tension into your story. So first off, Steph's motto, tension, tension, tension. Amp up the emotion, the terror, the stakes. That's yes. what I do when I'm revising or even when I'm editing someone's book. I'm like, this is this is good. You have the good bones here. But I want to feel absolutely terrified <laughs> for this character. So I'm like, amp it up. So how do you do this? Don't let your characters have what they want. That's simple. Ooh, it's a good tip. Don't make things too easy for your protagonist, your hero, because we need conflict. And the way to have conflict is things aren't going well for them. There is opposing forces. So you can ask yourself, how do I make my character's situation worse? Think Murphy's Law. Anything that can go wrong will go wrong. (laughs) Let your hero struggle through obstacles and even lose battles. So. Which can be a really hard one when you're writing a character that you love. And I don't know about you, but when I'm reading a story or watching a movie, I don't want the character to struggle. (laughs) You know, you're like, oh, no, you know, or you're watching a series and the episode ends where your character is in just a terrible way or in this horrible, torturous situation. You're like, no, but guess what? That's exactly what you want, because now the reader needs to know what's going to happen. And I know for me, it was that was a hard one for me, because I tend to just personality wise, want to resolve things quickly. I don't like, you know, like if I'm upset at someone or there's something going wrong, I don't like to leave lingering tension. I like to wrap things up. I like things to be okay in my world and in my relationships. And so as a writer, this was a really hard thing for me at first. I actually got really good advice from somebody once. They had read my first three chapters and they said, Angela, you need to write more dangerously. I was writing a little bit too people pleasery, a little bit too like, let's wrap it up and like move on to the next part. And I know with Merlin in my first book, he is like abandoned all of the people who depended on him because he was grieving and he just didn't care. And he kind of left the world to crumble and rot because he's like, I'd rather die. And that choice, that selfish choice, he had to be confronted with that and go back to see all of the people that he had abandoned and had basically left high and dry. And 
Um, my first version of the scene when he comes back and he meets Guinevere and a couple of King Arthur's men that are remaining after Arthur's death. And they're a little angry at him, but, you know, they forgive him and they let him come in and everything's happy. And I remember I had somebody read this scene and they're like, no, they need to not forgive him. They need to be upset. Let Merlin Ooh. stew in his mistake for a little yes. while longer. And so I went back and rewrote that scene. And it was a huge lesson from, for me from then on out. Like, don't just wrap things up. Allow things to continue on and be not okay for a while. Let that tension linger. Yes. Because... <laughs> Because then, you know, the reader is expecting and hoping that they get to that resolution. So yes. that might get them to, you know, to turn the pages to that chapter when you eventually do get to the resolution. But yeah, it's key not to not to wrap it up, resolve it too quickly. Be okay with the, your character struggling and possibly failing. So that is yes. something I, I play with in the Race of Arjun book two and the Iron Kingdom series. I love to kind of have my characters fail. And then what does that look like, you know, tension wise for them? How do they have to overcome inner conflict? And oh, it, it creates it creates a lot of tension between the characters. And I just love exploring character depth. So yes. Um, I intentionally wanted to go through what it would be like for my characters to have a sense of failure and where do they go mm -hmm. next. So creates a, a good launching pad for book three. <laughs> it is, yes. And those those hooky moments that want to that people are like, what? Like that's a good reaction to get from your readers. Is that what? You know, <gasps> you know, it, you know, just like with. Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker, he finally finds out, okay, not only do we find out that Darth Vader is his father, but he gets his arm cut off and he falls to his death only to just barely be rescued. And then that's the end. And that's like, you know, like that, just that lean in, like things aren't resolved. It's not right. over. Um, and things have just escalated. Um, and uh, it's so funny because, you know, I was a kid of the 80s and I remember I was a little too young to remember like people's first reactions to um, that scene in Star Wars. But uh, my brother-in-law was not. I remember him telling the story like people coming out of the theaters with their, oh, you know, because that was like the first That's time so people had seen something like that. Look, Darth Vader his father. Oh, my gosh. You know, and here's Luke Skywalker. When's the next movie coming out? Um, and uh, that kind of tension is so great for your hero. And ultimately, it, you know, Star Luke Skywalker, who'd been happy-go-lucky, comes in there and he kind of is left in a really bad place, kind of like a failing place. And it, But it makes all the, the audience hungry for the third book. It's gonna, They're going to be talking about it. Like, that's the huge takeaway. Did you know that, oh my God, Star Vader turns out to be his father? Yes. Fun. Fun fact, apparently George Lucas like consulted a psychologist to make sure that such a bombshell wouldn't like have psychological effects on children. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> and it funny. has to do with like the time, like in the early 80s, it was like, uh, would this be devastating to kids if yeah. they find out that like our hero has been his 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 ultra enemy is actually his father? Like, yeah, what would that but do to like kids' minds? I I appreciate that he like wanted to do that to consult a psychologist <laughs> about it. <laughs> Well, that's an interesting but, thing when you are writing tension in a story and some of the decisions that you make to create that tension for your reader. It's a, it's a little bit of like you're weighing and measuring, like, is this going to be too much? Are, mm -hmm. Am I going to lose my readers? Is this going to be too hard for them to, to walk through this? I, I remember uh, I just recently had um, somebody read my first book and she got to the end and she goes, I was getting really mad at you. <laughs> we were getting close to that ending. She's like, this cannot be how this book is going to end. And I ended up, she had a really good reaction once she got, you know, all the way through it. But um, 
there was that weighing and measuring as I was writing. Yep. Like, is this going to be a good way to end this or a bad way to end this? You know, is this going to make people too mad to want to pick up and, you know, keep going? You, you can't please everyone. So no. you have to trust your gut and tell the story that you want to tell. Um, I, when I got my development edit feedback from my editor for Heartsmith, she's a horror loving person. Yeah. So she, in her analysis, she's like, I love the horror. I love all the dark, gruesome Frankenstein aspects. Like, but it could be a little too much for some people if they're not prepared for it because yeah. it's kind of so happy, lucky in, in the beginning. It's a steampunk fantasy. And then it's like, it's real dark yeah. towards the end. But I'm like, I'm not shying away from the fact that I'm calling it a steampunk gothic horror. So yes. if you can't handle any horror, it might not be for you but like yeah my my purpose was to have it be spliced between oliver twist and frankenstein so i went with the ending that i wanted to tell and definitely cliffhanger <laughs> it definitely makes your jaw drop <laughs> <laughs> but it, it, it was a satisfying enough read that you get to the end and you're like okay so when is the next book coming what's it, the next yep. it was satisfying in the way that you want to know you're not giving up on it you're like yes okay now tell me what's going to happen because i don't know if i can wait <laughs> all right let's go to tip two and this is very scenes tension levels so juxtapose your action and calmer moments to create uncertainty Ooh, I, love, I, I love playing with this so um oftentimes my scenes are like a roller coaster that's how I kind of envision it it can have like a real tension action moment and then we we come down and there's introspection and dialogue there could be emotions I feel like I have characters that get angry and then cry <laughs> in the same scene so there's always just this ebb and flow um with my scenes. So try try playing with that. You're creating uncertainty. They don't know if there's gonna be more danger coming and I might throw in a little danger at the end just to, mm, that's right, flip to the next page. Let's we still going. have We still have tension, but I have to say in those things, like you do want to have the ebb and flow because it, even I remember when I was younger and I read Lord of the Rings for the first time, I still remember that reaction to them finally getting to like Rivendell and getting to rest and eat something. Mm -hmm. And you're like, <laughs> to oh, eat so yes. oh, thank God. You know, like, thank God they're resting. You know, you're just like, you feel such the, the heavy burden throughout the story that there is that necessity sometimes to, to, to come down to come down and give a break. And even if it's short, even if there's some lines in there to keep you reminded that, okay, not everything's yes. okay, but at least right now they're resting and eating. Yes. <laughs> they're going to be okay right now. I feel like in the third book, the ghost gambit. So third book in the iron kingdom series, um, there's like no moments of rest for like the first third of the book. It is just constant yeah. Yeah. tension. And so then it's like, if you, as you settle into the middle, you have to put in those little tension moments where maybe if they are eating, if there is a scene where the characters are resting, I'm going to still remind you of the stakes, yes. the possible danger and what the mission is. So that way you're like, okay, that's right. We haven't forgot about the purpose. We're just in a state of, we need to heal maybe. So <laughs> yes. We need to regroup, we need to recover. And then so our strength is up for really the next big hurdle that's coming. Yes. All right, third tip build flaws and conflict into your setting story world. So this is like your overarching conflict. Um, so when we have a whole episode on world building, and so I'm not gonna really dive into that, but make sure there is some entity overarching conflict that is kind of the main goal or the main mm -hmm. antagonist of the story. Cause you're gonna have tension moments between characters and little action sequences that have tension, but so like in the Iron Kingdom series, the overarching conflict is you have this Mestrian empire that is oppressing the Shandrian kingdom. And that's where my main characters live. So it's kind of always there that there is this government, these people that are in power and my characters are not, do not have the ability to govern themselves. So by the, I tease that in book one and then in book two, it really like hits a tipping point and it becomes almost like the main conflict. But 
you I have a villain that is like the representation of that overarching conflict. So just something to keep, you know, keep in mind that that might not be a conflict that will resolve itself. That could be like the whole series conflict. That is an overarching theme. Like now it becomes resistance against an empire. Yes. I think the, the flaw, the whole overarching theme, sometimes if you're, so example in Once in Future Chronicles, the, the bad guy is kind of behind the scenes. He's kind of a shadow and he kind of begins to emerge more and more and more throughout the stories. But there is this oppressing factor that is building and the characters are always being reminded of even though he's not in the forefront at the beginning and so it's really important however you need to weave that that you don't ever want that like oppressive power to seem invisible you want your readers to always feel it even if it's not present in the moment or in the chapter that they're reading they're still feeling it they still are aware of it they're still freaked out about it i know in stephanie's books the mestrians are such a um oppressive power almost like the nazis that even you know you get this like sometimes when her characters get a little too relaxed you're like okay you better not be relaxing because there's so there's been built in the overarching theme such a massive powerful group of um people that um and you know kingdom that um you don't quite relax you could just feel that always in the back the tension even when it's not set it's like gnawing it's gnawing yes. on the back of your character's mind so, yeah and i love you yeah. doing inner dialogue for that purpose just as like to show hey the character hasn't forgotten that yes. there's people after them there's soldiers coming ah, like we're gonna get hung we're gonna <laughs> yeah there's a gallows rate waiting if we fail so um, also with this tip is introduce new conflict as others are resolved. So the overarching conflict with like the Mestrians might not be getting resolved. That might be the whole series. Just like with Angela, there's this whole shadowy oppressive force. And as we go through the story, we find out who those people are behind the scenes causing, you know, the darkness and the, you know, the issues that, that are um, antagonizing the characters. So, but you can have like small little conflicts. It could be internal conflicts with characters. It can be, oh, we just, uh, you know, we antagonize the bad guys and what's that gonna look like? What's gonna happen next because of that? What's yeah. the fallout because of that one time we stood up? So it's like yeah. the domino effect, the snowball effect, one problem leads to another. And I feel like that's exact, I used that method a lot when I was writing The Race of Argens. Like, okay, one person made one quick decision that sets everything in motion. So it becomes like, what do we have to do next? How do we stop this? How can we stop this? What do we have to do to make it happen? Now that we've resolved that, what comes next? So it's this constant. Yeah. And I like the tension. I love the tension that you build in your stories because you want the good guys to win, but you're aware very early on in the stories that the good guys can't win without consequences. So there isn't like this win-win easy get the bad guys. It's like if we go this route, if we do this, if we make this choice, things could actually get worse. And um, I like that kind of tension in a story, even though it's hard to read and it's hard for your characters. I don't know how many times reading Stephanie's books, I'm like, oh, no, I can see where this could possibly lead. Like, no, you know, and yet you want the bad guys to, to be thrown down so badly. And you know that it can't happen unless the characters make um, some brave choices. But uh, anyway, it's super good tension. And I love it. Thanks. So I know I probably already mentioned this a couple of times, but tip four is create conflict between your characters. Don't let all of your characters get along. Mm -hmm. Have them fight. Have them dislike each other and mistrust one another. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Because every, every person has their own ideas and every situation they may approach it from a different angle. So when you have multiple characters all in a room, I think one of my favorite scenes in the race of origin is when they're all sitting down having a meal. So talk about like, it's a moment of rest. We just had a huge conflict, like in the middle of the book, the villain does something terrible. And so Tahira and Rowan are kind of in this like, oh my God, we have to stand up and do something. And so they're gonna do this talking over a meal. And you have five characters all sitting at a table 
who are approaching it from different angles. They have different thoughts on how to attack the problem. Some people are level-headed about it. Some people are like, you know, guns blazing. That's Akron kind of person. Let's just squash this and <laughs> fight. So it, it can be fun because everybody has something to add and they're not going to get along. They're going to yes. have different strengths and weaknesses. And so it creates for a nice dramatic scene. There can be humorous elements. There can be like the wisecracks. There can be put downs. <laughs> yes. You know, just think of like high school. Think about kids all sitting at a table. And it's like, ah, now let's, you know, if you talked about football, if you talked about just something, everybody's going to have a different idea and opinion about it. And not everybody's yes. going to agree. Well, and I, I love the opportunity for, um, because our characters can't, the best, the, the hero you want to cheer for is going to be an imperfect hero because mm -hmm. that's more realistic. That's more relatable. And there is something about the opportunity of, of all of the characters trusting this hero and then that hero disappointing them. Just within that structure of a story, I like um, like The Knight's Tale, uh, the movie with Heath Ledger. I love, I, love, I love that movie. It's like one of my my favorite movies to just go back and watch it's again. It's my favorite romantic comedy. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. So many one-liners from that movie. It almost, to me, is like it could almost hit Princess Bride level for me. Um, but uh, what I love about this scene is they're like near the end of the story. Hopefully this isn't spoilers for anyone who hasn't seen the, the movie, but there he has got this this band of people who have just the William character who believe in him. They're like, at first, they're all laughing at him. You want to change your stars. You want to become a knight. You're a peasant. It's impossible. It's not going to happen. But over time, he convinces them. Even beyond, he can't, he hasn't quite even convinced himself, but he's convinced them that he can change his stars, that he can do this. And then when it really came down to push, it comes to shove, he disappoints them. He he surrenders them. They want him to run away um, right. and save yeah. himself. And he's like, that's not what a knight does. And he kind yep. of disappoints them. He's like, I'm going to put myself in the, the position of dying and, and yeah. you know, being punished for this choice that I made because I believe it. And, um, mm -hmm. uh, and that's so hard. I always, you're like, Ooh, no, you're disappointing everybody. You know, that feeling of just the weight of the decisions sometimes that the heroes have to make and then disappointing everybody. And um, there are feelings and emotions based off of that, but anyway, it all turns out. Okay. But I, I love that. I, I think sometimes some of the serial shows that we watch, like I I've watched a lot of supernatural last year, <laughs> But you've got you, you've got these two brothers that want that live and die for each other. Like this is the the whole dynamic of the entire show. But how many times they disappoint each other, and you're like, no, and your heart gets ripped out of your chest. You're like, no, don't Sam, don't not trust you know Dean or Dean, don't trust Sam. You know, like you gotta you gotta trust each other, you guys. You gotta do this. Um, and it's it's a really uh, good way to keep people invested because you know you want them to get over it and forgive the other characters so that they can go and save the world. Yes. Oh, man. See, I just watched The Matrix oh, <laughs> yesterday. Yeah. Uh, which is like, but it's probably one of my, hu my husband's like favorite movie. And he's like, oh, it's on Netflix. So he just starts it. And of course, I'm like, great. There goes my next two hours. <laughs> because the, the movie has everything. And we want to talk about tension, like just how it starts. It doesn't explain anything. You're just thrust right into a very high tense scene, a chase. We don't know any answers. We don't even know what's going on. But like the cast of characters don't always get along. You know, as you progress through the story of Morpheus, who believes that Neo is the chosen one and his crew are all following Morpheus's lead, hoping that he's right. Because yeah. like, what if he's wrong? They're putting their lives essentially on the line. Yeah. Or this belief, you know? And so I just, I love watching that movie because it, it's got a great story, but I love the tension between the characters. And you even have, you have like a Judas type character with, with Cypher, who's like, yes. I, don't really buy in, I don't really buy into this. So there's great moments where Cypher is kind of chipping away at people's beliefs. He chips away at Neo, like, pff, guy's kind of crazy, right? 
you know, trying to belittle Morpheus. And then like he talks to Trinity, like, you really think this guy's the one? Like, come on. So <laughs> it's great because it makes us lean in. Like, who is this guy? Is he, he's is he is he not really part of the cause? And then you find out, of course not. He's <laughs> to portray him ah. Let's <laughs> i always get so mad doesn't matter how many times i've seen the movie I'm like dang it like i crazy. know just kills me but hey that moment of tension it's like we don't know if our heroes are going to make it yes we don't. which is exactly what you want you don't want your reader convinced that your heroes are going to be successful <laughs> yes they're gonna they're gonna struggle they're gonna fail some one might sacrifice for the other and so you have that conflict of making a decision like uh oh one way or the other either I die or if someone I love dies so yeah. this gets yeah. this engages the reader's emotions definitely and yes. that's tip five so yes. main readers care so they feel conflicts or dangers keenly it's like we know back to the matrix we know with some of the foreshadowing something is about to hit something's about to happen we know that this guy's going to betray him how's it going to happen who's going to die you know yes like, no, we, we don't yep. want our favorite to die because oftentimes side characters <laughs> they steal the show and i'm always so sad when like my favorite side character uh, it. bites it oh it is it's so it's so crushing it and <laughs> That and that even as I'm writing, especially when I was writing book three, and you're as a writer, you're like, who do I sacrifice? Because right. there there does come this point where you're like, I can't let my readers think that the heroes are gonna be just easy peasy successful. Everybody's gonna be fine and everyone survives. And I had to really think, like, how do I do this and how do I write this? Because I love my characters. And, you know, and you love your readers too. So you're like, how is this? And ultimately you, you make the decisions you think are best for the story. Um, but, yeah. you know, and, and I think that's why Lord of the Rings was such a pivotal story and still touches so many people today because you get so emotionally engaged with these characters, particularly Sam and Frodo. And you yes. get to the end and this, the climax of, all the struggle, all they did to get there, starving to death, suffering, burden, they get there. Yeah. And then Frodo can't do it. And you're like, oh, what? You know, and I you're so emotionally invested. Oh, and, and then you've got Sam that's just this beautiful character that, that stands up. But even then you're like, is, is Sam going to be able to do it? Um, right. And um, that is such great tension and it's because we are so emotionally invested in these characters and um them being triumphant and all of the characters that are you know even over at the gate you know who are about to just well we've got nothing else to lose we're just gonna fight until we die because that's all yeah. left to do and so you've yes. got this whole tension of the moment or like everyone's just gonna die <laughs> until the Eagles show up and <laughs> Sam, you know, kind of almost doesn't save the day. And um, such great tension there at pulling on all of our heartstrings because you fall in love with those characters so strongly. Um, you've been with them through the journey and all the tension. It's just yes. so beautiful. And that's why you care is because you've been with them and you've, you've fallen maybe in love with them individually, but then it's like how their love for each other that's yeah. what really tugs on our emotions because we don't want one of them to die because it's how's it going to impact the other yes character yeah. you know when, if one of them gets lost yeah which is why yeah. a good love story is always good to have like we were talking about <laughs> earlier a love story is a great way to make a reader emotionally invested because yes. there's even more at stake when it comes to uh all of the climax and all of the things coming together now you know you've got this this love bond that is at could be sacrificed could be mm -hmm. you know completely obliterated so yeah there's something that there's something that can be lost yes and it's it's gonna just <laughs> rip the heart open if they're separated or if one dies or oh uh, yes so 
uh, emotional investment is key. Yes. yes. As we were just saying, define defining stakes and preventing characters from having what they want helps with this, you know, engaging your reader's emotions. All right, tip six, increase the consequences of failure for the hero. What's it look like if your hero fails? How will this affect the story? How will it affect other characters? Kind of what we were just discussing. So does your character get wounded? Mm. Is a paradigm shift needed for an anti-hero's arc? So these are good questions to ask yourself. And I know when I was writing, I was getting stuck kind of with my ending for The Ghost Gambit. And whenever I get stuck, I often turn to my, my sister Liz. <laughs> I'm like, here's my problem. I don't know how to resolve this. I'm like, if one decision is made, it could go this way. If another yeah. decision is made, it can go that way. I could kill a character and that would destroy the whole arc I had planned for them. And it would be so <sighs> actually gripping as a scene. And I don't know if I need to do that. Or <laughs> it's like, the possibilities can be endless. And so I kind of have to ask myself some of these questions and like, how how is it going to affect my other characters the strongest? What's the worst case scenario that could happen mm -hmm. in this moment? And if I choose a certain course of action, is it going to give me the best gripping launch pad to start the next book if you're doing a series? Because I always like to start on a real action kind of note <laughs> yes. with my books. I love the media's res. So I think of what's going to be a really satisfying climax for a book, but also leave me in a great starting place for the next one. So it doesn't start kind of boring. And so having like your, your character get wounded can change the course of a scene. It could change the course of a battle. So don't be afraid to do that, but you'll have to also ask yourself certain questions. Like you can't have your character get too wounded that then like, right that should kill them. <laughs> right. So you got to be strategic and think a little, little ahead um, on that one. Yeah. I even like when I'm writing in my, my new series, I have a character who was crippled at birth and um, he's got a lot of supernatural elements that are connected to who he is and what he can become. But essentially he's got a choice to make. He could be healed if he wants strings attached to um something dark and bad and he does make that choice so there's a failure right there there's like a moment mm -hmm. where he's like man i'll do anything to not be in pain anymore i'll do anything to be able to be a hero and a good guy but so i'll you know sell my soul kind of thing and um and this is my hero right and this is the choice this is like everyone who's going to read this story is going to be like no no <laughs> <laughs> don't do that, you know, and yet, you know, we can't, we're, we're trying to really uh, try to help people identify with where he was at when he makes that choice so that they're still cheering for him. Yeah. Because not every choice is going to be like right or wrong or like right. it, there's, we're human and we want our characters yeah. to feel human and that, you know, we don't always make the right decision. So yes. if we can be in that moment and grapple with like, we've all been in pain. So I, yeah. I can understand if you'd be tempted to make a certain decision that's going to make his life easier. Is it a wrong decision? Is he consulting like dark magic? But yeah. if so, like, what's the consequence? Like maybe, maybe this could heal a, the character for a time and then there comes the consequence. So right. that might be where the paradigm shift happens and they have, they learn a lesson from it. I love it. So good, good tension there. So our last tip is end scenes on cliffhangers. Yeah. <laughs> it's like a love hate with them. You know, as yes. writers like, yeah, I, I really nailed it when I, I end on a cliffhanger. <laughs> and I know it's going to make the readers keep reading, which they, probably love and hate that too. <laughs> yes. So it compels the readers to turn the page and keep reading and it increases your pacing and tension and it raises questions. Like, especially if like, you know, you're reading at night and you get to that cliffhanger scene and you're like, dang it. Yes. Gotta keep reading. <laughs> I always think of my chapters like um, shows in a miniseries. Like if you watch, especially shows from like the you know, early 2000, 2010s, there was a lot of TV shows out there where they leave you on the edge of things not quite, or like another problem beginning 
right at the end of the episode or something not quite being resolved or somebody like thinking somebody's dead. <laughs> I feel like prison, <laughs> prison break did that every episode. Yes. You're like, oh, you know, and then people are like, okay, well, and I do this a lot of time when I'm watching a show, I'll just watch the beginning of the next episode. Right. So that I know what happens next and then I'll stop the show, but then I don't. This is how binge watching happens. And this is how binge reading happens also. Yeah. Leaving a chapter, even like in a small tension, um, we're going to be talking about, um, macro tension in another episode but just leaving it where two characters right at the end have a this is a really bad thing to somebody and it ends that's the end of the chapter and you're like whoa how, how are they going to react but leaving those chapters not completed or resolved or yes. leading into something else so that the reader wants to keep reading throughout the book those tensions are so important um you can't always have a hook at the end of your chapter but you want to as often as you can um, yes keep those hooks going and if you have a series um that you're writing um and even if you don't know what's going to happen in the next book if you're a pantser like stephanie is you know and you don't necessarily know how the next book's going to go but you know you're going to write some more books leave the story not entirely wrapped up with a nice little bow. Do right. something that causes people to go, oh my gosh, I can't wait for the next book to come out. I can't wait to see yeah. how this resolves. You maybe resolve one part of the story, but not another. Yeah. Or part of the story gets resolved, but it's now opening up for right. like, what's going to happen next. It's like smaller conflicts were resolved, but the overarching conflict is still in effect. Yes. Yeah. 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 Don't and, and with chapters, don't always give the full answer. Yeah. yeah. Like leave it to where they're getting leave a clue. The mystery. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Leaving mysteries and secrets open is definitely is a good skill to, to insert. So yeah. And as Angela said, we are going to be doing an episode on micro tension. So didn't want to overwhelm you guys with all this tension talk. So micro tension is something that's going to be like moment by moment, line by line, inserting um conflict juxtaposing the calm and the the you know the conflict so yeah that will be another episode and, and that will really that. yeah me too and I, I think this is one of my favorite things about writing I think one of the things that I was taught really early on is every chapter needs tension well what do you, how, what does that look like and so we're going to discuss that in um, um our micro tension episode and you guys thank you so much for joining us and being a part of the ink mages listening to our episodes um we hope that you enjoy our nerdy banter all of our fantasy talk we've got a lot more lined up coming for you a lot more writing tips as well as fun fantasy banter that we have headed your way um our books are releasing soon so be ready to be following us on social media to see all of those up and coming things that are going to be releasing with Stephanie's children's book that is launching and with my, um, my third book in the trilogy launching. Please leave a like, subscribe, comment on our episodes, and please let us know if there is something that you would love us to hit on as um, a writer. And another thing we'd like to just put out there, if you are a sci-fi and or fantasy author. We do really think mages. We want to stick to storytelling and what we know best, and that is sci-fi and fantasy. So those are the kind of authors we'd love to interview. So if you are a clean reads author and you write fantasy or sci-fi, uh, be following us on social media to be ready to see where you can apply to be on our show. We'd love to have you on. And again, we love you so much. Thanks for joining us, and we'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.